Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our first candidate forum this fall for the Office of Escambia County Sheriff. We'd like to welcome our two candidates, Chiefs Alexander and Simmons. Also, our moderators and especially our audience watching in Zoom and on Facebook. This forum is co-sponsored by the League of Women Voters in the Pensacola Bay Area, as well as the Pensacola Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. A quick reminder to the audience, especially in Zoom, your microphones and video cameras have been muted to improve our bandwidth and to keep the noise level down in the background. And we'd like to remind you that uh, you'll be able to access a video recording of this forum on our Facebook page or our YouTube channel. You'll find buttons to each one on the upcoming events page uh, shown on this uh, URL at the bottom of the screen. And you'll find this URL in Facebook as well. So tomorrow the YouTube will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, a, a quick rundown of how the uh, forum will run. Candidates will have two minutes for an opening statement they will have one minute to respond to each question, 30 seconds for rebuttal time, if they so desire, and then a closing statement of one minute. We do have a timekeeper, Vivian Faircloth. She will be giving a 30 second warning by holding up a yellow card and also calling that there is a warning for the opening statements, the question responses, as well as the closing statements. She'll hold up a red card to let people know that time is up. We wanna thank our director, Vivian Faircloth, and all the people who helped us write questions for this forum and the others that we plan to do this fall. So both the Pensacola alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta and the League of Women Voters uh, members wrote the questions that you'll hear tonight. Folks on Zoom and on Facebook may also ask questions. So if the question topic hasn't been covered already in the forum toward the end of time, we'll squeeze those questions in. Uh, just to give you some information about our moderators and the two entities that are sponsoring this forum, Kimberly Ward is representing Delta Sigma Theta. Uh, this is uh, a private, not-for-profit not organization whose purpose is to provide assistance and support in local communities throughout the world. They do this through their five point programmatic thrust, economic development, educational development, international awareness involvement, physical and mental health, and political awareness and involvement. Since its founding on July 13, 1913, more than 300,000 women have joined this fine organization. The Pensacola Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority was chartered on April 20th, 1949, which means that they've been serving Escambia and Santa Rosa counties for 71 years. Whoops, sorry. Haley Richards represents the League of Women Voters, which was founded in 1920 the same year that the 19th Amendment was passed, giving some women the vote. Its mission was to help women register to vote. But some women had to wait. For example, Native American women could not vote until 1962. Uh, Latina women in Puerto Rico could vote in 1935 but there was a literacy test that kept most of them from doing so. So it was really 1975 before all women in Puerto Rico could vote. Asian American women could not vote until 1952 
and mm -hmm. African American women had to wait until the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The League has always been a nonpartisan organization. Its mission evolved to empower all voters and to defend democracy. We like to say that we try to make democracy work. Its role in the community is twofold, voter service and citizen education, plus study and action. At this point, I will turn the forum over to our two moderators, Haley Richards and Kimberly Ward. All right. Thank you, Mary Louise. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the first in our series of candidate forums. Um, and we will start with our introductions from each candidate. And so we're going to do that just um, using alphabetical order by last name. Um, so that means Chief Alexander is going to have the first two minutes, followed by Chief Simmons. Um, and then we'll start um, with our questions. And then you'll have uh, time for a rebuttal if need be. All right. So. If Chief Alexander, if you would like to go ahead and begin your two minute introduction. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having uh, us on this forum. And uh, I count it an honor to be able to participate uh, also with my opponent. Uh, my name is David Alexander III. Uh, I was born right here in Pensacola, Florida. Um, I have a, a bachelor's degree in criminal justice, a master's degree in human resource management. I'm a graduate of the National FBI Academy. Uh, my, I attended public schools here. Uh, I'm, I'm married for 35 years. I have two children, two adult children uh, who attended public schools here as well. Uh, I retired in 2017 after 32 years of law enforcement experience. And uh, I'm ready to take the role as sheriff of this county. I believe the sheriff role is a very powerful role it's a role that's given to him by the voters of Escambia County. The power comes from the governor of the state of Florida. And those deputies represent what the sheriff stands for. And those, that service goes out into the public. And what I want to do as new sheriff of Escambia County is bring safety, security, and services to all of our residents throughout Escambia County. And I'll demonstrate during this, this uh, forum my knowledge, my skills, and ability to do so. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. All right, Chief Simmons, your two-minute introduction. Uh, thank you. I, too, appreciate uh, the opportunity to come here and to be with you. Um, I am Chip Simmons. I'm a lifelong resident right here in Escambia County. I went to Bellevue Elementary School, Bellevue Middle School, Pine Forest High School, Pensacola Junior College, uh, Troy State University, where I obtained my bachelor's degree and master's degree in public administration. I also am a graduate of the FBI National Academy. I'm married uh, to my wife, Susan, for the last past 34 years, and I have two grown sons, two uh, not-so-grown grandchildren, and one on the way. I have been a lifelong resident of Escambia County and a lifelong public servant here in Escambia County. I started my career in 1984 at the Escambia County Sheriff's Office. Two years later, I went to the Pensacola Police Department, where I rose up the ranks, uh, mostly working narcotics investigations, SWAT operations. Um, I was the youngest police chief in department history at age 46. Uh, while I was the police chief, I did a, a number of, uh, of innovative things with regards to enforcement and engagement that I'll get into a little bit later. Uh, I was in a job program, so I went uh, from the Pensacola Police Department to be the assistant county administrator uh, for Escambia County, which put me over all of public safety, uh, corrections, EMS, firefighting. Um, and, and, and I did all of that before I, I eventually got hired on to the Scheme County Sheriff's Office to bring some of my expertise that I gained uh, at the, the Pensacola Police Department and at the Board of County Commissioners. I have been the Chief Deputy uh, for the last three and a half years. And again, I, I think the Scheme County residents need the- 30 seconds. Uh, I believe the Scheme County residents need the most qualified, the most experienced, uh, individual to be the sheriff. Uh, they need a sheriff that has not just done the job, but has done the job well. I'm proud to say that I'm one of the most decorated officers in Pensacola Police Department history, and I intend to bring uh, enforcement and engagement to levels we've never seen to the residents of Escambia County. All right, thank you. All right, so now we're going to get into our questions. So um, as mentioned, so Kimberly and I are co-moderating this forum. So I'm going to ask you all the first series of questions, and then I'm going to turn it over to Kimberly, and we'll kind of go back and forth um, till we get through all of the prepared questions, and then we'll ask for the questions from the audience if they're 
um, coming in from Mary Louise. Um, and then we'll just kind of go like in alphabetical order. So um, since Chief Alexander got to go first with intros, that means Chief Simmons will start out um, with the first question. And then I um, will just repeat the question twice just to make sure that you hear it all. Um, and then you can uh, think about your answer and then Vivian will start the timing. All right, so here we are. So Chief Simmons, so the first question. So it says, how have the past few months changed your outlook on the role of law enforcement, if at all, and what would you do to fill that need? So how have the past few months changed your outlook on the role of law enforcement, if at all, and what would you do to fill that need? Uh, I would say that the role of law enforcement is to keep a community safe. So, and I'm not sure, sure if you're talking about the COVID virus or the, uh, the riots that have been in, in the streets, but uh, I think it covers both of them. The role of law enforcement is to keep a community safe. It is important for us to be able to bring our children to the store without having to worry about being a victim of a crime. It is important uh, that we be able to live our lives and, and, and know that if we need a law enforcement agency, if we need a law enforcement officer, that they're a phone call away. And when, they arrive, seconds. And when they arrive, they will, they will show up in a professional, courteous, uh, and efficient manner. And, and that is what, that's always been the case. And in the last couple of months, we have, as kind of come to the forefront and we will continue to find ways to improve that service because ultimately the safety of our residents is paramount. Okay, all right. So Chief Alexander, so the same question. How have the past few months changed your outlook on the role of law enforcement, if at all? And what would you do to fill that need? Well, one of the things that the last uh, several months have done change my outlook is that it has strengthened my convictions that we need better relationships between law enforcement and taxpayers voters we need better relationships that will help us as law enforcement officers keep our community safer by them being more engaging with law enforcement and law enforcement more engaging with them but we have been blessed in this area to have gone through not only the coronavirus but even hurricane sally and without incidents that would have been equated 30 to seconds. Uh, mass uh, uh, unrest. Uh, that comes from leaders in the community working together. And I believe as a sheriff, I can forge those type of relationships that we would be able to face any crisis that we face as residents in Escambia County. Okay. Anyone want to do a rebuttal? If not, we'll go on to the next question. All right, so hearing no need for rebuttal. All right, so our second question, so um, Chief Alexander will go first with this one. So the same thing, I'll re ask the question, repeat it, and then you'll, your time will start. So quite, second question says, in Escambia County in 2018, there were 11.2 arrests in schools per 1,000 students. This is high when compared to several counties with similar populations. Since these arrests are usually carried out by school resource officers, how are school resource officers selected and trained? And is the training mandatory? So in Escambia County in 2018, there were 11.2 arrests in schools per 1,000 students. This is high when compared to several counties with similar populations. Since these arrests are usually carried out by school resource officers, how are school resource officers selected and trained, and is the training mandatory? Well, well, I couldn't tell you from the inside what type of training they receive. What I can tell you, <clears throat> in my experience at the Pensacola Police Department, I was a captain over the school resource program, and certainly we sent our school resource officers to training that was related to their, their duties in the schools and they work both as law enforcement officers as well as guardians in the school. And so um, I believe that um, having the experience of leading that, seconds. that the sheriff department, after their assessment, we assess their trainings, that we can get them involved in the type of training so that they are guardians in the schools as well as police officers. We need a better relationship between the younger generation and our officers, and I'm the person that can bring that relationship. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so Chief Simmons, I'll just repeat it one more time. So it says, in Escambia County in 2018, there were 11.2 arrests in schools per 1,000 students. This is high when compared to several counties with similar populations. Since these arrests are usually carried out by school resource officers, 
how are school resource officers selected and trained, and is the training mandatory? Thank you. The, uh, the cadre of school resource officers that we have come from uh, the agency itself, come from the deputies themselves. The first thing they have to do is show an interest, and then they go through an interview so that we make sure that the people that we put in our schools are the people that, that are out there to engage in our students, to engage with our teachers, to engage with the principals. And then we also send them to school resource officer training, which brings them to a, uh, a certification level. So you have to have the desire to do it, then you have to go to the training. And 30 then seconds. Have, and, and then we have the, the in-house training. So, and then the, we have the yearly training that they have to have. So we want to continue to monitor the school resource officers because we know how important the safety of our children are. And, and the last thing we want to do is take them out of that school environment and put them into DJJ or in, in a, a, a jail environment. So our effort is to make sure that the schools are as safe as they possibly can, and the people that we put in those schools have that function, that engagement function, uh, to, as professional and as meaningful as we possibly can. 60 seconds. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I think you're finished right on time. All right. So our uh, last question that I'm going to ask in this first series, and I'm going to turn it over to my co-moderator. Um, so question number three, so we'll start with Chief Simmons. Um, so this one's kind of similar to the previous one. Um, so then this next question says, when compared to arrests, civil citations for use for nonviolent misdemeanors save considerable tax dollars in processing, court costs, and housing, and also saves the youthful offender the lifetime burden of a criminal record. The Escambia County Sheriff's Office lags behind the Pensacola Police Department in their use, and Escambia County is 20th in the state in their usage. So what will you do to improve these statistics? So when compared to arrests, civil citations for use for nonviolent misdemeanors save considerable tax dollars in processing, court costs, and housing. It also saves the youthful offender the lifetime burden of a criminal record. The Escambia County Sheriff's Office lags behind the Pensacola Police Department in their use. Escambia County ranks 20th in the state. So what will you do to improve these statistics? Thank you. This is, this is kind of my expertise. I was brought to the Escambia County Sheriff's Office because of some of the programs that I instituted at the Pensacola Police Department. The cadet program, the body camera program. But one of those is also the juvenile civil citation program. As you know, there are certain parameters set by the state attorney that we as a law enforcement agency are allowed to use juvenile civil citations. When I was at the police department, we had a model program like that. I made that the default enforcement action for all of the, the Pensacola police officers. I was even approached to try Third to make second. sure, I was approached to try to get, get in touch with the sheriff's office and make sure that we can use the program we had at the police department at the sheriff's office. Now that I'm at the sheriff's office, we're moving forward with that same, um, uh, you know, those same policies so that we can make sure that the, the juveniles that are, that are eligible for a civil citation will get a civil citation. So again, I was a bit of a pioneer in this and I will continue to do that as sheriff of Escambia County. All right, thank you. All right, so uh, Chief Alexander, do you, you need me to repeat the question one more time? Yes, go ahead. Sir. Okay. So it says, when compared to arrests, civil citations for use for nonviolent misdemeanors save considerable tax dollars in processing court costs and housing. It also saves the youthful offender the lifetime burden of a criminal record. The Escambia County Sheriff's Office lags behind the Pensacola Police Department in their use, and Escambia County is actually ranked 20th in the state in their usage. So what will you do to improve these statistics? Well, first of all, I'm going to change the, the way uh, the school resource officer position is perceived. Right now at the Sheriff's Department, the school resource officer position is a dumping ground for deputies that they don't want, uh, they're not going to promote. Uh, there's no insignificant position at the Sheriff's Department. All positions are valuable. And so I'm going to change the mindset of those positions in the department. The next thing we're going to do is make sure that deputies are aware of how important they are in the lives of children every day. The other thing is that when, when there's an opportunity 30 to seconds. give a civil citation, I want to know why it wasn't given, and we need to make it mandatory that it's, a, it's documented when a civil citation is not issued that could have been issued. I think when we work together with the schools and parents, we will bring those numbers down because we will have that kind of relationship. All right. Thank you. All right. So, Chief Simmons, 30-second rebuttal. 
Uh, my opponent says that the, at the Skim County Sheriff's Office that the school resource officer program is a dumping ground. That's demeaning to everyone that we have at the school resource officer program. That is not true. I'm not sure where they get that from. Um, I, I would hope that in the future that whenever he would say something like that, that he would have a, a, at least an inkling of truth to it. The people that we have at the school uh, resource officer program love their job. They do a fantastic job and we're very proud of them. All right. Any other rebuttal for that question? If not, then, oh yeah, go ahead. Yep, 30 seconds. Uh -huh. Go ahead. They don't promote them. And we all know if that relationship was what it needed to be, that those numbers would come down. Uh, I've worked in the schools. Matter of fact, PPD was recognized as having one of the, the best school or police relationships throughout the state of Florida. It's about who's in leadership. And I believe when leadership uh, makes sure it's mandatory that these results are brought to the forefront, then it, it happens because those deputies want to know that they're doing their job and they want to be recognized. Uh, it takes leadership. And that's what I will bring to the Sheriff Department. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'm going to turn it over for our next set of questions uh, to Kimberly Ward. Um, and so, and then she'll start with uh, Chief Alexander. We'll get the next one. All right, Kimberly. Nationally, ethnic and racial groups have been targeted for arrest. What steps can be taken in Escambia County to prevent this kind of ethnic and racial profiling? Okay. Well, first of all, we've got to improve the relationship. We want to emerge deputies into neighborhoods so that the uh, citizens, by being engaged, will have an opportunity to improve the quality of life uh, through their interaction with deputies. We've proven that this works uh, in the city. And certainly there are people in the county who wanted the same type of activity in their community. Having access to deputies uh, whom the, uh, the actually the sheriff whom the citizens elected will also empower them to be a part of the problem solving in the neighborhoods. We want to increase that positive interaction between citizens. 30 seconds. So that they will, it will bring those racial tensions down. Uh, we know that racism is an issue that's been around uh, Pensacola for a long time, but it's take forward thinking and also take a desire, commitment to leadership, to bridge those relationships so that we can minimize the effects of racism on our community and our police community relationships. Simmons, same question. Nationally, ethnic and racial groups have been targeted for arrest. What steps can be taken in Escambia County to prevent this kind of ethnic and racial profile? Testing. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, you make mention that uh, nationally, ethnic uh, individuals have been targeted. I don't know that we can say that. I think we need to look at statistics before we come out and say those, those types of things. I can tell you that an accredited professional organization has safeguards in place. We provide training. We have provide bias training, equality training. Uh, we have every single traffic stop that we make has been is recorded based on the sex of the driver, uh, the age, the race of the driver, and then if then those those that information. Thirty seconds. That information is is evaluated and it is an appearance for for bias. Uh, then we will address that sort of thing. When I was a police chief, I instituted the body camera program, the very first one in this region, for that reason alone. So we're transparent so that there is no bias, no perceived bias, and certainly no real bias. Any rebuttal, Chief Alexander? Yes. Uh, I'd just like to say, first of all, to say that there are no racial problems, I think uh, my opponent got his head in the sand. There's a history of racial tension in this town, and there's a lack of leadership for the last three administrations to address. If, if there were some racial bias, then how come my opponent hasn't brought them to the forefront? He worked directly for me for 11 years at the Pensacola Police Department. I know he said earlier that uh, we placed Spanish. mediocre or moderate deputies or police officers in the school resource officer program. I put him, I put my opponent in that school resource officer program. So I'm, I'm, I assume that's not what he's talking about. But I can tell you that uh, if there is bias, and my opponent was aware of it, he should have made a complaint. He should have done something to change that in the 11 years that he worked directly for me. OK. Uh, I think I was interrupted uh, with this conversation before I had a chance to finish. 
But I did bring those biases to his attention and he did nothing. So uh, that's why I'm running for sheriff. I wouldn't run for sheriff if my opponent was really a bona fide candidate. The problem is that we have had 12 years of lack of responsibility at the sheriff department and it's time for a change. And if he was a credible person like he's saying tonight, I wouldn't waste my time running. You are definitely wasting your time running. Our next question, Chief Simmons, what yes, training should deputies receive to handle mentally ill persons without inflicting deadly force? Thank you again. Um, whenever I was the assistant chief of police and then certainly the police chief, uh, a total of 11 years, uh, I was over them. We did what we call CIT training. And what we did is when I was police chief, we mandated that for every officer that we had at the Pensacola Police Department. That went uh, a long ways towards us as, as a police department, understanding the needs and what services are available to those with special needs. And it is, it is a widely known program now. We have a number of deputies and, and it's hard to kind of uh, to calculate. 30 but seconds. I you, but I can tell you that we have saved numerous lives just from the training, just from the interactions that we've had, from the knowledge that we've gleaned and I can tell you that I was the one that instituted that mandatory program at the Pensacola Police Department. And I would be the one, I would be the sheriff that would institute that mandatory program at the Escambia County Sheriff's Office. Thank you, Chief Alexander. What training should deputies receive to handle mentally ill persons without inflicting deadly force? Well, first of all, I think the training that uh, is in place has been in place for quite a while. Um, and, and I think the problem you're gonna have is what, how are you gonna do, how are you gonna manage that small percentage of, of officers that will not follow rules that will not do what they're supposed to do. And this is what has failed us in the community regarding leadership in the sheriff department, a failure to hold people accountable for what they're trained to do. And that's why as a sheriff, I will hold officers accountable for what we're trained to do. 30 because seconds. Do what we're trained to do, you're gonna find we're gonna be more effective and that people are gonna be more receptive to our actions in the community regarding people with mental illness. Chief Simmons. Uh, the, the holding people accountable and holding people acceptable is a major tenet in the accreditation process. The accreditation process is such that, that every one of our policies not only is evaluated uh, for standardization, but is also um, what we have, we have what we call proofs, which means show us, prove to us that you're abiding by these policies. So if we have these accredited, accredited standards and we have these accreditation stand, uh, policies and then we have these proofs, then clearly we're abiding by these. Can we get better? We always try to get better. And if my opponent has something to say that, that we're not doing so, 30, I, haven't heard 30 any, seconds. I haven't heard a single complaint from him and I look forward to seeing those complaints. Question, Thank you. Chief Alexander. How will you handle officers when it's been determined that they have used excessive force? Well, first of all, uh, because that's such a top, a hot topic, those are things that we should manage. And when you use excessive force, you know, there's very little tolerance for that. Uh, like I said, sometimes, you know, you can't take uh, every situation and judge it the same way, but I'm not shy of terminating employment because what we, the last thing we need is for heavy-handed policing to be the order of the day and citizens lose confidence in their safety when encountering law enforcement. Being, being tough on those issues- 30 seconds. For leaders today in law enforcement. And as a sheriff, I will make sure that officers are held accountable. If it means terminate, if it means filing uh, criminal charges, they will be held accountable for doing what they're supposed to do. And when they don't do that, we're gonna make sure the appropriate actions are taken. Thank you. Simmons, same question. How will you handle officers when it has been determined that they have used excessive force? Uh, it's pretty simple. And, and uh, what you have is a set of standards. You have a, a level of performance that, that you will only tolerate that level. And if anyone falls beneath that level, if anyone um, proves to you that they, they cannot uphold that certain standard, then you have to address it. We do address it. We've always addressed it. Uh, I've addressed it when I was the assistant chief of the Pensacola Police Department. I addressed it when I was the longtime police chief at the Pensacola Police Department. 
and I certainly address it now as a chief deputy. Although I'm not the sheriff uh, uh, at this point, as sheriff, I will, I will continue to look and to monitor and those employees that do not uphold that courtesy, the integrity, the professionalism, if they don't uphold those standards, then we really don't have a use for them. And we will make, make sure that they no longer work at the Escambia County Sheriff's Office. Chief Alexander? Yes, I, I believe if that, if he, if my opponent was true to what he said, then we wouldn't have these discussions in our community right now that questions uh, the, the, the trustworthiness of deputies. Uh, it's time to deal with that small percentage and deal with them correctly. And I believe if this is something that the administration has been doing, then it wouldn't be a reason for me to run for office. I'm running for office because citizens, taxpayers are tired of the, the, the sheriff department being rep misrepresented when they know there are good, hardworking people out there. It's just you got an administration. 30 seconds. Their job. All right, so I think that's back to me to ask the next set of questions. Um, so we'll start with Chief Simmons for this section um, and follow our similar format. So this kind of is a nice segue into the next grouping that has to do with um, recruitment and um, of potential officers. Um, but the first question um, asks, in your own words, explain what your relationship will be with the Escambia County Board of County Commissioners and the City of Pensacola Police Department in an effort to carry out your initiatives for safe and healthy neighborhoods. So in your own words, explain what your relationship will be with the Escambia County Board of County Commissioners and the City of Pensacola Police Department in an effort to carry out your initiatives for safe and healthy neighborhoods. Thank you. I think that this is what I'm talking about when we compare um, qualifications and we compare experience. I have, again, I was a police chief for over five years, the assistant chief for six years. Um, I went to the Board of County Commissioners working with the, the existing Board of County Commissioners, and now I'm at the Sheriff's Office. So no one, no candidate would have anything close to the experience that I have working with the police department, working with DEA, ATF, the FBI, no one would have anything close to working with uh, the Board of County Commissioners and even now in my, in my existing uh, uh, area of responsibility as the Chief Deputy, we work with the Pensacola Police Department all the time. We share a really good relationship as evidenced by the, the terrorist act at, at Pensacola NAS. We partner with every local agency and, and uh, in the end, uh, we had our Scammon County Sheriff's Deputies uh, do, a, do an admirable job in saving many, many lives. We will continue to work with these agencies. I have the experience working with them in the past and we'll continue to do that. One minute, stop. Okay, thank you. All right, Chief Alexander, same question. So in your own words, explain what your relationship will be with the Escambia County Board of County Commissioners and the City of Pensacola Police Department in an effort to carry out your initiatives for safe and healthy neighborhoods. Well, one of the things is we definitely will work close to each other uh, especially from not just uh, from the top, which will be different, but all the way down to the bottom. Uh, our jobs are overlapping. It's important that we partner with each other. It's also equally important that we work with the Board of County Commissioners so that we understand each other's needs and challenges and that we can come up with a budget, a funding uh, a project that will fund the, the public safety of our taxpayers. Uh, I have a history of working with- 30 all seconds. Uh, government, non-government, as well as community. So as a leader at the Sheriff Department, that won't be a problem for me, working with the Board of County Commissioners, nor the Police Department. All right, thank you. Any rebuttal? Not seeing any hands or indications. So we'll just move on to the next question. Um, so this one we'll start, we'll start with Chief Alexander for the next one. So it says, what do you envision as incentives to encourage candidates to apply for positions with the Escambia County Sheriff's Office and do you anticipate recruitment of more minorities? So for example, women and people of color for your team. So what do you envision as incentives to encourage candidates to apply for positions with the Escambia County Sheriff's Office? And do you anticipate recruitment of more minorities? So for example, women and people of color for your team? Well, we will definitely market the Sheriff Department as a place where uh, people want to work and have a career. So that means the men and women there have to be able to, to emulate that to the public. They are key to our recruitment. So 
So I will, I will make sure that opportunities are available, not just to get a job at the sheriff's department for women and ethnic minorities, but also for them to see a clear career path to opportunities for promotions. And they got to see that with the men and women that work out there now. Right now, it's too politicized as to who gets the promotions. 30 seconds. So what I want is give them an authentic career path and, and promote, recruit, and hire the type of deputies that we want to serve our and protect our community. So you got to do that by leadership. And I think I would be the first recruiter and the marketer of the sheriff's department. All right, thank you. And Chief Simmons, the same question. So what do you envision as incentives to encourage candidates to apply for positions with the Escambia County Sheriff's Office? And do you anticipate recruitment of more minorities, for example, women and people of color for your team? Thank you. The, the first thing is we have to offer a competitive wage. We have to make sure that the job that we have is attractive to the people that are local, to the veterans, and that's what we have done. We have moved uh, to a cadet program that we had at the, when I was a police chief at the police department. And I can tell you right now, there are zero openings at the Scammy County Sheriff's Office for sheriff's deputies. This is the first time that's happened in over 15 years. And it's happened because we have a, a dedicated outreach uh, to, to target those in our community, those in every community, those of every- 30 uh, seconds. Those of every race, those of every sex. And I think that the recruitment is working very well. We want to continue to strive to make sure that the sheriff's office uh, the demographics mirrors that of our community. We want that. And then we want to make sure that uh, not only do we get them on board, but we show them that they have a career. They could potentially be a captain, a commander, or even run for sheriff of Escambia County. The sky's the limit at the Escambia County Sheriff's Office. All right. Thank you. Any rebuttal? All right. So the next question is somewhat similar, but just might have some some other thoughts that you might want to share. Um, so the next question will go to um, Chief Simmons first. So it says, what would you propose to increase the recruitment and retention of females and other minorities by the Sheriff's Department? So what would you propose to increase recruitment and retention of females and other minorities uh, by the Sheriff's Department? I think with it, what you have to do is you have to get out in certain areas. You have to get out with with some youth clubs. You have to get out in high schools. You have to get out in, in, in locations where you know that there are potential recruits, whether it is in the military. We have, we have a number of, of terrific military bases around here. So we can get our message out there to them and show them that a career in law enforcement, specifically a career at the Escambia County Sheriff's Office, you can raise a family here. You can live here in Escambia County, in beautiful Escambia County. And all you have to do is just pass this background check. 30 so seconds. Primarily what we want to do is we want to make sure that we have a larger pool as we possibly can. We want to engage the people where they are and then get, bring them on board, show them the, the career path that, that, that we have to offer. And I think that, that then the job itself, the professionalism itself, the, the, the sheer pride that it takes in law enforcement, that itself will bring them to the steps of the sheriff's office and we'll take care of the rest. We'll move you on up. All right, thank you. And then Chief Alexander, so the same question. What would you propose to increase recruitment and retention of females and other minorities by the Sheriff's Department? Well, first of all, I create an atmosphere of integrity, make sure that there's a fair and impartial process. Uh, one of the things that uh, our current administration has failed to do is create a fair environment for female officers, uh, which is evident with uh, the promotion practice uh, and, and that led into a lawsuit uh, with a settlement. And, and this, is, this is something that's been going on uh, for a long time. So we got to create a fair and impartial process for women in the Sheriff's Department so that uh, 30 seconds. women will not be difficult because a female can see herself advancing through the ranks and being able to uh, grow and develop into a professional officer that she desires to be. And I, the sheriff, new sheriff of Scammy County, We'll make that happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any, all right, Chief Simmons, rebuttal, go ahead. Yeah, that's the second time that my opponent has made mention of uh, some sort of integrity uh, flaw. And, and I wish that uh, had he known about these integrity flaws, he would bring them to someone's attention. He makes comments about uh, an individual uh, employment type uh, situation. That happened way before I got to the sheriff's office and, and there was a settlement and he, he quite frankly has no idea what that settlement was about. So again, I, I think it's, it's irresponsible to just start talking about something that you may have read 
on Google, or you may have read on a blog somewhere. All right, Roberto. All right, hey. Chief Alexander, go ahead. Yeah, but but he also, my opponent, had the same track record at the Pensacola Police Department. There were issues there where women were complaining about being treated fair, and it was actually under his administration. So he's not dumb and naive to it. It's a realistic issue. Things follow you that you permit and you promote. And what I'm saying is time to stop permitting and promoting mistreatment of women in the workplace, especially in the Scammy County Sheriff Department. And I would definitely be a sheriff that will put a stop to it. All right. Thank you. Oh, nope. We only have, I think, time for one rebuttal each. Um, okay. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll take care of it next. Yeah. All right. So uh, Kimberly's going to ask the next set of questions. So Kimberly. Her question in that same vein, and then we're going to change tracks. So um, Chief Alexander, how do you think that the current ads featuring watercraft, dune buggies, rappelling, et cetera, accomplish the recruitment of candidates who are interested in supporting your mission of improving the quality of life for the citizens of Escambia County? Well, I, I think they don't help at all. Uh, I was recruited uh, years ago uh, into law enforcement by a positive interaction with both white and black law enforcement officers. And what they did is they showed me, number one, they were human being. Number two, they showed me they were interested in my safety and well-being, and they were willing to engage in a positive interaction with me and made an impression upon me. Um, as guardians of the community, that's something I wanted to do. And I emulate that to others, and I've been able to recruit other officers through the same way. Thank you. Chief Simmons, same question. How do you think that the current ads featuring watercraft, dune buggies, rappelling, et cetera, accomplish the recruitment of candidates who are interested in supporting your mission of improving the quality of life for the citizens of Escambia County? Thank you. My, uh, my opponent probably doesn't realize it, uh, but, but whenever you uh, rappel, whenever you have a SWAT operation, whenever you have uh, a beach operation, you actually have to arrest people. There are bad guys out there that need arrests. And very rarely are they, do they just give themselves up or does the, the apprehension of someone go, go very smoothly. I think that to say that uh, what is in that recruiting video doesn't, ha doesn't happen is a lie. And, if, and, and you're being naive. What we wanted was for people that, that would want a, a job in law enforcement to know what takes place in law enforcement. You cannot go in law enforcement and expect not to arrest somebody. You cannot go in law enforcement and expect to not have to run or to chase somebody or to sometimes fight for your own life. And I think that it would be disingenuous to put something out there that all we have to do is, as my opponent says, just sit around there and, and, and hug somebody. And that's just not the reality. There's an engagement part, but there's most certainly also an enforcement part. And I will tell you that the uh, recruiting video has been wildly successful. Um, Chief Simmons, in terms of transparency, please describe the methodologies or activities that you will utilize to consistently educate and communicate your expect expectations to the citizens of Escambia County. Again, uh, transparency is my, my wheelhouse. When I became the police chief, the first two things that I did was I, I, I created an, an, an era where we were able to be accredited. Uh, for the very first time. The city of Pensacola has been a city since 1821, and they've never been accredited until I became the police chief. The second thing I did, and before it was popular, I put body cameras on every police officer at the Pensacola Police Department. To this day, they're the only major um, uh, law enforcement organization that has the body cameras. That is transparency. That is showing the people 30 seconds. in the county, showing the people that we serve, that we don't have anything to be ashamed of. If we make mistakes, we correct them. But this is what we're doing. This is what our officers' in, in, uh, interaction with, with it is on an on everyday basis. And I think that you can't get more transparent than putting a camera on the chest of a police officer to show exactly what they've done. Okay, thank you. Um, Chief Alexander, same question. In terms of transparency, please describe the methodologies or activities that you will utilize to consistently educate 
and communicate your expectations to the citizens of Escambia County? Well, you have to be honest. And that's something that my opponent has a hard thing doing, even at the police department. And even to sit here and say that he's invented everything at the police department. Do your homework. You're going to find out all this stuff. I can't do the cadet program. So how could he, how could he invent the cadet program? But do you know what? This is the kind of stuff we look at in leaders. People tell us stuff all the time. Be honest with people. Be a person of integrity. This is what we need, not only in Norfolk, Florida. This is what we need in America. Leaders to be honest leaders and hold themselves accountable for telling the truth. So you start off by telling the truth. Thank you, Chief. Uh, I, I, I don't know that I've ever said that I, I created the cadet program. I, I don't. I said I brought the cadet program from the Pensacola Police Department to the Escambia County Sheriff's Office. You can rewind it if you'd like. You can, you can have my, my opponent look at it again. But I did not uh, invent the cadet program. In fact, the Pensacola Police Department, we, could, we, we took that from somewhere else. And the reason I'm at the Sheriff's Office is so that I can bring things like the cadet program to the Sheriff's Office. It's a good idea. We just made it better. I'm not sure what, what, why is my opponent so angry about that. Yes, um, that's not the only thing he said that he invented. He said he invented the civil citation program. Civil citation program was brought to the Pensacola Police Department back in the early 19, 1990s. And it was proven to be a successful then. And if you look at the police department yearbook, you see a lot of things that my opponent is not being very truthful about. But you know what, this is what it's all about. If you're gonna be the sheriff of Escambia County, be an honest one, be one that brings integrity to the job. Integrity starts at the top, because if you can't trust who's at the top, it's going to make you trust everybody in the ranks and files. And that's what I think the men and women that are seconds. is actually tired of. Thank you. Sander, with anticipated funding shortages due to the COVID-19 pandemic, do you think the sheriff's budget will be negatively impacted? How can this be negotiated successfully with the Escambia County Commission? Well, certainly we're going to have to come in there with a set of priorities and, uh, and we're going to have to sit down and really hash out those priorities. And, uh, and I think recovery is something that everybody's going to have to look for ways to, to, to cut back uh, and understand that when time permits that we can add those funding sources and those uh, activities back on. But the number one thing we should be focused on right now is the safety and security of every citizen in Escambia County. And whatever I have to do as a sheriff, seconds. I'm going to make sure I make those decisions to make sure every citizen is safe, secure, and have access to police services. Thank you. Chief Simmons, same question. With anticipated funding shortages due to the COVID-19 pandemic, do you think the sheriff's budget will be negatively impacted? How can this be negotiated successfully with the Escambia County Commission? Uh, thank you, that's a good question because everyone knows that, uh, or everyone fears that there will be a bit of a, a, a budget shortfall. I think that what we are prepared, we have uh, placed ourselves in a position to where we have upgraded some of our pay structures. We are now competitive with the other agencies. So my, uh, my strong suit is negotiating with, uh, with the commissioners. We'll talk to the commissioners and tell them what our needs are. These are the needs in your community. These are the needs in, in, in your district. And it's very important because again, you cannot, you cannot afford to reimagine or on law enforcement. Uh, you cannot afford to do anything except to make sure that we have the deputies that are in these areas that are fighting this crime. They can respond to 911 calls. They can, that their, their, their response time is such that they can get there to be an effective law enforcement officer. And I, I think that we can do that, again, by negotiating with the Florida County Commissioners, let them know what our needs are, and I feel, I feel confident that they will, they will um, uh, give us the money to do so. Okay. I'm going to turn it back over to Haley for the next set of questions. All right. Thank you. All right. 
So we have uh, one more kind of budget question and then we'll move on to a couple other topics. So um, this, this set of questions, we'll start with Chief Simmons. Um, so the question is, how can the Sheriff's Department budget be used in the most effective way? And what areas of the budget would you change? So how can the Sheriff's Department budget be used in the most effective way? And what areas of the budget would you change? Uh, I think that any administrator um, uh, of an agency, a law enforcement agency, will take a look at priorities and they will say, uh, these, this budget funding needs to go towards the patrol division, which is the backbone of anything. We need to have uniformed, marked car deputies in these neighborhoods so that, again, the response time is short and the effectiveness is long. I think that we can do that. We have to make sure that the money goes towards our uniformed patrol uh, officers. And I think, again, as you continue to work with the Board of County Commissioners, you can make sure that they understand, they understand what this money is going for. What, what item, what line item, what operation uh, are we talking about? And if we continue to, to put the safety of the citizens first, we will continue to put uh, the deputies on the street and put the money where the deputies need it. All right, thank you. And then Chief Alexander, the same question. So how can the Sheriff's Department budget be used in the most effective way? What and what areas of the budget would you change? Well, you have to look at your day-to-day -day operating expenses and sit down with your budget and planning manager uh, to see what ways can you create, uh, take cost savings that might be earned over a period of time and shift those funds uh, to where they might be better used. Uh, there are some funds that are locked that you cannot move, but again, having strong priorities and being willing to, to do more with less uh, with the opportunity to come back later on and put back what might have been taken away. I believe that there are ways you can the, uh, the county commission and your budget and planning person to make the adjustments you need to survive through a budgetary crisis. All right, I'm not seeing any indication for rebuttal, so we'll kind of switch gears for the next question, um, which we'll start with uh, Chief Alexander. So the next question says, do you support an independent civilian review board with subpoena power? And please explain. So do you support an independent civilian re review board with subpoena power? No, I, I do not. Uh, subpoena Uh-oh, we might have to restart your answer because your audio cut out. A citizen review board and best utilize it to, to help bring awareness to your agency. Am I not coming across? Yeah, you're, you are cut out on the audio like right after you started talking. So we can restart. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we can okay. restart. I know. <laughs> I my think first, we're all... My yeah, answer go ahead. I do not support having a citizen review board with subpoena power because uh, they would need to be bar certified and also uh, uh, approved through the court system to have that kind of power. But I do believe we can take a citizen's review board and utilize them to bring a better relationship, to foster a better relationship between your community, especially when you utilize it countywide. So there's representation and feedback coming from the entire county and not just certain isolated areas. So I would not support a review board with subpoena power, but I would really seconds. review board to foster a better relationship between the sheriff department and the community. Okay, all right. And then Chief Simmons, so the same question. So do you support an independent civilian review board with subpoena power? Please explain. I, I do not, I do not. I do uh, support a liaison group. We had that whenever I was the assistant chief. Uh, and then I was a police chief, we had a, a liaison group where we were able to meet and discuss things that are important to each community. Uh, so I would support something like that. But we also had what, what I started at the police department and my, my opponent may hate this, but I was a, a pioneer with the, uh, the town hall meetings. I was the first police chief to have town hall meetings. Um, so we had them and they were, they were very successful because you got to engage with the community. The community came to me uh, and told me what their concerns seconds. are. They told me what their expectations are. They told us the good, they told us the bad. And then we, we took that information and then we implemented that. We made those adjustments so that we can better serve the citizens that we were uh, tasked with serving. It's, it's, I, we, we always take the uh, advice from the community because we feel like we are the community 
and the com community is certainly a part of the of the sheriff's office. All right. Is there anything, any indication for rebuttal? So we'll go on to the next question in this series. Um, and then we'll start with uh, Chief Simmons for this one. So this question says, in what situations would high speed uh, car chases be justified? And please explain. So in what situations would high speed car chases be justified? Please explain. I think when you look at justified, there's a lot of gray there. Typically speaking, a, a pursuit that involves a forcible felony, which is a serious crime, a crime that's, that if the individual is let uh, to, to just go, then they may well commit a crime to someone, a serious crime, a felonious crime. So if, if you have a, a pursuit of an individual that has been, um, that's just committed or in the process of committing a forcible felony, then, then you can allow that pursuit to take place. Now, again, just because you allow a pursuit to take place does not mean that that pursuit will go. 30 until, seconds. Uh, and that won't go until the wheels fall off. What the supervisors are tasked with doing and the, the deputy that's making the chase, the chase himself, what, what they are tasked with is to continue to evaluate. If this chase goes into a school zone, we call it off. If the chase goes to an area where uh, the chase itself has become more dangerous than uh, the reason for the pursuit, then we will cut that off. But generally speaking, it is the forcible felons and then with, with continuous evaluation by the supervision. Stop. All right, thank you. All right, and then Chief Alexander, the same question. So in what situations would high-speed car chases be justified? Please explain. Well, um, it's in those uh, felonious uh, events where uh, public safety is, is the, the, the top priority. Uh, you gotta look at it from uh, the potential of someone innocently being hurt as well as the uh, officers and the subjects involved. Uh, I agree with my opponent's answer. Uh, I just believe that uh, uh, um, accountability from the supervisory level is where uh, the rubber meets the road, is where the critical decision making is made. 30 seconds. And certainly when we train to do what we're trained to do and we do it right, then we minimize the likelihood using good judgment in the decision making. All right, a rebuttal, not seeing any. All right, so then I'm gonna turn it back over to Kimberly for our next set of questions. As a candidate for sheriff, we are sure that you are constantly thinking about promoting the safety and welfare of the citizens of Escambia County. Briefly, what would you consider to be your top three priorities for the Escambia County Sheriff's Office to address immediately upon your being elected? Well, uh, first of all, the, the number one thing is how can we make people safer in their neighborhoods, safer as they go about in the community and our children safer in schools? Uh, the next thing uh, I want to do is make sure that the Sheriff Department is uh, uh, organization trusted by all citizens and that we're fostering trusting relationships, not only between law enforcement and community members, but between community members and neighborhoods. I believe that once we do that, then certainly seconds. That the third thing is how can we move into the 21st century further and be safer because we're forward thinking and we're setting things up to make us safe because we're working together and we're stronger together. Thank you, Chief Simmons. I'm gonna repeat the question. As a candidate for sheriff, we are sure that you are constantly thinking about promoting the safety and welfare of the citizens of Escambia County. Briefly, what would you consider to be your top three priorities for the Escambia County Sheriff's Office to address immediately upon your being elected? Thank you, that's what we've been talking about a lot. Uh, we discussed the uh, the up and down with a periodic violent crime. And everyone knows that it's drug related. So what we would need to do immediately is to foster these relationships with the DEA, with the ATF, with the FBI, so that we can make sure that the people that are harming our neighborhoods, the people that are cho shooting our children and robbing our children, that they are held accountable, that they are arrested. So we will immediately embark on that. The second prong would be the engagement side. We need to make sure that we are in our neighborhoods because if you just if you arrest someone, if you arrest someone that needs to go to jail, then you also have to fill that void with something. 
And we think that if you fill that, vo that void with a communication, with a dialogue, with a relationship with the community, we'll all go farther with that. And the third thing, even though I have a short period of time, is enhance our training so that we can better provide a professional service to all members of every community. Next question, um, Chief Simmons. Please discuss the use of CCTV cameras in specific neighborhoods and crime prevention, as well as individual privacy rights. All right, thank you. Um, I can tell you that there are some areas that where, where we have so much uh, crime that it, it causes us to put cameras at like a neighborhood park. These cameras are not aimed at anyone's specific home. They're not aimed at anyone's backyard, front yard, anyone's, anyone's car. But what they do is ensure that the people that, that want to enjoy this park can enjoy this park without the concern that someone's gonna drive by and shoot them, without the concern that someone's gonna put, uh, walk in and rob them. People know that these cameras are there. And 30 what, seconds. And they also know that, that we can go to those cameras and we can find out who committed that crime. So we're very cognizant and very aware of the privacy rights of all citizens of Escambia County. These cameras are only in public areas, areas in which they have no little to no expectation of privacy. And it's, they're only there for the safety of each, each particular neighborhood. And that's the only reason that we use those cameras. Thank you, Chief Alexander, same question. Please discuss the use of CCTV cameras in specific neighborhoods in crime prevention as well as individual privacy rights? Well, when you, when you look at it from a crime prevention strategy, uh, getting out into neighborhoods, following up on crimes and incidents that have occurred, a lot of times both the neighbors and the law enforcement can, can together determine the best uses of, of, the, of the cameras. And, we, and, and also keep in mind uh, that we must always respect the privacy of all citizens. And when we do that, uh, lost audio again. His, his bandwidth is coming across as low on my screen. Did I cut out? You did. Yes. Okay. Okay, I, I can go back. Uh, you know, usually as a prevention measure, when we work with citizens, uh, usually when investigators do their follow-up, a lot of times the conclusion are drawn that cameras might be better utilized in certain areas and neighborhoods that will help keep uh, safety for the citizens. And that comes from a good police community relationship. And usually when we do that, and we also include our legal counsel, uh, we have a, we, we, we together will safeguard the privacy issues that may arise in the use of cameras, but it comes from a good police community relationship. 30 seconds. Okay. Got any other ones here, comments? Uh-oh. You know what? Can, can you still hear me? Uh, no, we can't. Yeah, you're good. I think Mary, yeah, yeah, yeah. I could. Yeah, I could hear my answer because I didn't know whether it was going to go out again. Oh, okay. You know, you know what we might do to save a little bandwidth on your end is, uh, I know it's not ideal, but maybe we could get you to stop your video and that way all of your bandwidth will be directed toward the audio. So if you can find the little button that looks like a, a, a video camera and just tap it, that will mute your audio and uh, and, and if you need to turn it off and on, then that'll be fine. We, we're not saying that you have to keep it off the whole time, but it, it seems like the bandwidth in your area is low. It may be due to the storm. It may be due to the fact that you're not sitting very close to where your, your internet modem is. But let's try that and see if it, it keeps you from, your audio is the most important part. If it keeps, uh, if, if it allows you to answer things without it cutting out. Is that okay, Chief Alexander? your audio we want you to stop video um, is what she was saying yeah it's right next to the, oh, there you go there you go okay. okay and if you need to turn it on to see something we can still see your name and we'll still be able to hear you okay. we just won't be able to see okay. you okay okay so the next good. question is 
I'm sorry. Were you were you done? No, no we're good. Okay. Uh, next question, um, Chief Alexander. What would your policy be on requiring deputies to use body cameras when interacting with the public? Well, um, as as we did at the city police department, um, there are certain things that body cameras are not going to be uh, appropriate to have activated, um, and and it would actually cause a greater harm to the public uh, by those. So we will have. Uh, accredited policies in place that will guide uh, the usage of body cameras and they will also maintain the tech integrity of the data which is covered with the body cameras. But it comes with a well planned out um, uh, policy uh, that the public will be aware of as well. So that 30, they will 30 seconds. And they will know that there are things in place to protect them and their privacy as a citizen. Okay, thank you. Chief Simmons, what would your policy be on requiring deputies to use body cameras when interacting with the public? Thank you. I think it's pretty clear. When I was the police chief, no one was pushing for me to get body cameras on police officers. In fact, a lot of the officers didn't want it. A lot of my staff members didn't want it. I had to talk to the, the city council, talk to the mayor, and we were able to get the funding for the body cameras. And the, the policies that my opponent were talking about are policies that I, uh, we started. I formulated those policies. We adhered to those policies. And because we had nothing to, nothing to hide, we were able to use these body cameras, the footage for critique of our own officers. We were able to use it for evidence. Um, and, and we were able to use it lo looking for um, courtesy and integrity and the professionalism that I'm talking about, about before. I think that if you if you want someone to build you a house, you clearly go to someone that has built a house before. And I am the only candidate that's come close to instituting a body camera program. And so I think when I say that I support them, that when I say that we're going to get the body cameras, uh, I think that you can you should be able to believe me because I've done it before. Yes, um, I I have a rebuttal uh, since he. Brought um, the issue. The body cameras came from the lack of trust between the community and the Pensacola Police Department. And when he was negotiating as assistant chief with Movement for Change and the NAACP because of the lack of trust, that body camera project became what would definitely get him the support he needed to become the chief of police. It wasn't because he voluntarily did it. It's because he wanted to be the chief just that bad that he would institute wow. body cameras. So let's be straight up and clear about that. Uh, you didn't just voluntarily do that, Chip. Uh, you did it because you wanted to be chief. Stop. Time is up. Simmons. Uh, yeah, um, I don't know what he's talking about. I can tell you that the body cameras were solely my idea. You can speak to any of the senior staff members. I went to the board myself and I, I put the body cameras on myself. Uh, I, I know that be, uh, because I was the police chief and it wasn't had nothing to do with movement for change, although I appreciate movement for change making me the, uh, the officer or the man of the year uh, that one year. I really do appreciate that. I can just tell you the body cameras were my idea, solely my idea. My, my opponent must not have been around when, when we were doing this body camera. Stop, thing. 30 seconds. I'm done. All right. All right. I think that's back to me, right, Kimberly? <laughs> they both had a chance to rebut that. Um, all right. So we're going to change gears just a, one more time. So we have a couple more rounds of questions. And then just as a reminder to those that are watching us um, or participating via Zoom that we are taking some questions. So please make sure that you send those in. And Mary Louise is helping keep track of those. And we'll get to your um, audience questions at the end. Um, all right, so our next set of questions, we're going to start with Chief Simmons. Um, so this question says, given the increasing demands for public safety resources throughout Escambia County, how would you handle response times to ensure equitable coverage for all areas of the county? So and given the increasing demands for public safety resources throughout Escambia County, how would you handle response times to ensure equitable coverage for all areas of the county? 
Uh, as you know, Skimmy County is rather large. We have two beaches and then we go all the way up to Century. It's pretty big. What you have to do is you have to evaluate the number of calls for service. You have to uh, evaluate the number, the, the, the population base in any particular beach structure. Everyone does it this way. We did it at Fence Coast Police Department. We do it at the Skimby County Sheriff's Office. So to provide coverage to those who need it the most, you have to make sure that you have your beach structure large enough or small enough so that there's a deputy within just a, sh a short a period of time. 30 seconds. To be able to answer and respond to these calls for service. Uh, and to also uh, make use of backup, backup officers as well. Um, we have done this, everyone does it the same way. We will take a look at the numbers and we will make sure that we have an adequate coverage for every community, every district, every beat, every precinct in Escambia County. All right, thank you. And then Chief Alexander, so same question. Given the increasing demands for public safety resources throughout Escambia County, how would you handle response times to ensure equitable coverage for all areas of the county? Well, and, and my opponent did uh, give you a, a very good answer. That's a universal answer. But I think uh, the, the, the stewardship of, 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 of managing your staff and manpower, making sure you manage the resources in the areas such as the, uh, the uh, 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 substations throughout Escambia County, making sure they're probably properly staffed and uh, that deputies are centrally located where they can be responsive and that we're making sure this is done through uh, supervision and, and, and proper decision. 30 seconds. Uh, I believe that accountability in those areas, when they're held to accountability of doing what they're trained to do, then you'll see the deployment of, of law enforcement services in a way that's very acceptable to the public. All right, any rebuttal? Not seeing a rebuttal sign. Um, all right, so then we'll go on to the next question. So then that's gonna go to Chief Alexander. So the next one says, some law enforcement agency have, have found it to be effective to hire a social worker to help with response to certain types of calls, such as homelessness, mental illness, substance abuse, child neglect, etc. This frees up deputies to respond to more urgent and potentially dangerous crimes. Are you willing to consider such a plan? So again, some law, enfor law enforcement agencies have found it to be effective to hire a social worker to help with response to certain types of calls, such as homelessness, mental illness, substance abuse, child neglect, et cetera. This frees up deputies to respond to more urgent and potentially dangerous crimes. Are you willing to consider such a plan? Absolutely. Um, that's, that's where the uh, idea of shifting of duties uh, that could be shifted to other agencies such as uh, social workers. I believe that part of community policing means also forming those type of partnerships with agencies that eventually you have not been accustomed to forming partnerships with to make sure we're reaching people uh, with services. And certainly if it's something that falls in the realm of enforcing laws and protecting lives, then law enforcement is gonna have to be involved. But yes, I'm all about uh, shifting some duties to other agencies and entities that will help us uh, deliver the same type of quality service. Okay, Chief Simmons, so the same question. Um, so some law enforcement agencies have found it to be effective to hire a social worker to help with response to certain types of calls, such as homelessness, mental illness, substance abuse, child neglect, etc. This frees up deputies to respond to more urgent and potentially dangerous crimes, are you willing to consider such a plan? Uh, yeah, I would believe that uh, if you want to hire a social worker to alleviate that, uh, those calls from law enforcement, um, as long as that uh, the hiring agency is a county or a, a, a mental health uh, type of program, I'm all for it. But if it takes even $1 from law enforcement, the law enforcement function, then I would be opposed to that. I do think that there are many cases that, that you don't need a law enforcement officer. You might need someone that has a mental health uh, background. Um, the, the, the ones that you talked about, everything, but probably child neglect. Uh, I believe child neglect probably needs to be in, investigated as a, as a crime. But the others you're talking about, I would love to have someone um, with the expertise that can handle a, a, a mental health patient or someone that needs some sort of a, of, a, of a social service outside of the law enforcement realm. But I would be opposed to that if it takes any money from the law enforcement side because we have our own priorities. And, and if you take anything away from, from us, then uh, you, you will make our community less safe. Stop. 
Okay. All right. Any, I don't see or hear any uh, rebuttal for that one. So we'll go on to the next question. So this one we'll, we'll start with Chief Simmons. So it says, what do you consider to be the top three crimes that are being committed in our communities? Please share your plan to reduce the crime rate within our community and the roles that citizens can play in this process to assist in deterring the crime rate. So what do you consider to be the top three crimes that are being committed in our communities? Please share your plan to reduce the crime rate within our community and the roles that citizens can play in this process to assist in deterring the crime rate. Thank you. I think that the, the top crime is this uh, drug-related, drug trafficking-related violent crime. Almost every day you can hear about someone that's a drug-related crime, someone getting uh, shot or beat up or something like that. I think that that is the number one uh, focus for any, any law enforcement agency, whether it's Pensacola Police Department or the Escambia County Sheriff's Office. As I mentioned before, I spent over a dozen years working narcotics, working on task forces. I know what it takes to work a narcotics investigation. I also spent a lot of time on SWAT and, uh, and working on seconds. apprehension. So I have the, the experience to take care of that. The second thing is there's a lot of fraud going on with computer related fraud, which is which unfortunately also touches on child porn, that sort of thing. So again, we work with our other partners, with our other agencies, and make sure the people that are victimizing our most precious resource, our children, we take them off the streets and put them in jail where they belong. The third thing would be just a domestic violence. We need to make sure that we work with with the agencies and get the information out. If you see something, say uh, if you, uh, if you see something, say something for us. To us. I knew I'd run out of time on that. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, all right, so we have uh, both both answer that. I'm like lost track. We've been going so well, and now I'm like distracted. Um, oh, no, Chief Alexander does not did not answer that. That's right. That's what I thought. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so next, so the same question to Chief Alexander. So it says, what do you consider to be the top three crimes that are being committed in our communities? Please share your plan to reduce the crime rate, rate within our community and the roles that citizens can play in this process to assist in deterring the crime rate. Well, I think the top three crimes uh, are, are going to be your assaults, uh, your thefts, and of course, your quality of life crimes that even makes your schools your churches and your businesses places targeted for, for criminal activity. Uh, what I would do, number one, is we gotta raise awareness and we gotta give citizens the tools that they need that will help them be safer and then encourage them to work with law enforcement uh, in an effort to bring those who are violating these laws uh, to justice. Uh, you can't arrest your, all your problems, but certainly you can partner with citizens and with other agencies to make sure that you uh, arrest those who need to be arrested and those that need to be uh, referred to other sources uh, to, for redirection, you do that as well. But it takes a holistic approach. It also takes forward thinking for the 21st century strategies of keeping people safe in their neighborhoods. All right. Any rebuttal or anything? I don't see. I have no idea what he said, so no. Oh, did it break up? Well, no, I just, he only answered two of the three questions, and I was just curious if you would give more time. Oh, well, they get the full full time. If they don't take the full time, then there's just time left on the table. We'll All right. So, seconds left. Yeah. Oh, just a couple of seconds. All right. So we have our last little set of, um, of questions. So I'm going to have um, Kimberly ask the last one. So I think we're up to, because um, some of our ones are a little bit in re repeat of topic. So um, let's see. So Kimberly, the next one is the one about uh, law abiding youth. If you want to ask that one, does that help? <laughs> Sorry, we're trying to like keep our numbers straight. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, go ahead. And then I can ask the very, very last one if you, if you don't mind. Chief Alexander, what programs will you initiate or advocate, if any, to empower our youth to be law-abiding citizens? Okay, well, uh, first of all, uh, I have done a lot of uh, programs and work with youth outside of law enforcement. Uh, uh, and uh, usually outside of law enforcement is where the most critical time uh, 
is 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 utilized to for young people to get involved in crimes. But when you create opportunities for officers and community members to have interaction, uh, I will bring programmatic activities. Uh, there are activities that can also be supported through a law enforcement trust funds that will bring opportunities for to interact with young people to guide them uh, in a positive direction and also in your audio again. I don't think he... Chief Alexander? Did... Yeah. Yes. We lost your audio again. Yeah, just on the last part, I think, of your answer, though. Okay, but what I would do is I would definitely work with uh, as many organizations that are willing, those partnerships with community organizations to create opportunities for young people to be exposed to a better way of life. And sometimes that means taking them out of their neighborhoods that they've been stuck in for, for all their life and show them a, a life outside of their neighborhood, give them something to dream for. It's worked, I have the experience, I know it works. We've worked with the Department of Justice on a Kids and Cops program. And, uh, and we were recognized in San Diego, California. Uh, it's time is up. In terms of community policing. Okay, thank you. Chief Simmons, same question. What programs will you initiate or advocate, if any, to empower our youth to be law-abiding citizens? Thank you. I think my history in regards to mentorship, I spent uh, almost 15 years working with youth in football and baseball and, and what that really was is, is opportunities for mentorship. And the men, by mentorship, I, I, I mean, don't just talk to them about the sports themselves, talk to them about life, talk to them about making decisions, talk to them about their future, take them with you. I, I have had players and, and, and kids that I've, I've dealt with for years that we were able to take them across the bridge for the very first time. They've never been out, out, of, out of our community. And if you have that opportunity, don't just drive and look at the water. What you do is you drive and you talk to them. You give them an opportunity, give them a sounding board. You talk to them about the future and what they can do. I think these are important and we continue to move that, whether it's with a police athletic league or partnering with other agencies um, that can continue to enhance this type of thing because the, the youth of our community is our future and we cannot afford to neglect them or ignore them. Have a rebuttal, Chief Alexander? Oh. Uh oh. Wait you a have, minute. Uh, you got some reverb. Okay. Let let, let me. Logged in twice. Okay. Let me let me see if I. Okay. It worked. Okay. We're good. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, I just like to say that uh, you know, being a uh, uh, over twenty years as a mentor for big brothers and big sisters, I I was one of the. Uh, matter of fact, I was the chief that brought that um, bags and bigs uh, to Northwest Florida. And, uh, and I just like to say that I would encourage officers, deputies at the sheriff department to become a big brother. Uh, a lot of times you are able to set uh, an example for a young person and change their mindset uh, about law enforcement. That was something that the officers at the Pensacola Police Department enjoyed. So we take this thing far beyond sports. We give them life uh, life experiences, not only in their community, but even as far as going out of town and, uh, and, and other parts of the state. It's historic, it's civic minded, but it's also enlightening and it's life giving. And so I support mentorship. I support those things that will give our child a better future. Thank you. Go ahead, Chief Simmons. Yeah, I, I guess I just want to uh, add to that. There are opportunities, not just in town. You can take these uh, these kids out of town and, and you can show them that there is a great big world out there and that the sky is the limit. I was fortunate enough to be the volunteer of the year and also get the lifetime achievement award uh, award from a local youth uh, uh, sports uh, event and it's based solely upon the work that we've done. We created a youth sports camp when I was a police chief and we also had uh, a Christmas giveaway when I was a police chief. All these things were designed to concentrate on uh, the youth in our community, and specifically ah, the youth that were in, in danger. Okay, 
You had them both up at the same time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got mixed 30 seconds and, and stopped. <laughs> That's okay. okay, we have one, one last prepared question, and then we'll uh, see if we have any questions from the audience. And I will start with you, Chief Simmons. Do you foresee any changes in or an implementation of diversity training for your staff? And if so, what target areas will be inclusive of this training? Uh, thank you. There's a lot been uh, said about specific training. And so well, I went back and I, I took a look at all of our training, the six or seven aspects of training that we do at the Escambia County Sheriff's Office and what we did at the Pensacola Police Department under the accredited guidelines. And I can tell you that we already provide a, a tremendous amount of training. It dates all the way back from the rookie school to field training to our yearly uh, yearly training. And then there are mandated training, um, you know, human diversity type training set aside by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. 30 so I seconds. Think, I think that if you continue to want to be a more and more professional agency, you'll take a look at every every piece of this. If you do a little bit of training, let's see where we can enhance that. Let's, let's, let's uh, take that up, liven it up, and make sure it's appropriate to the environment that we live in today. We've always been committed to change and to, to better ourselves, and we're going to continue to be committed to that change and to make ourselves the very best agency this area has ever seen. Thank you, Chief Simmons. Chief Alexander, same question. Do you foresee any changes in or an implementation of diversity training for your staff, and if so, <coughs> What target areas will be inclusive of this training? Oh, first of all, we're going to start inside the sheriff department. If diversity is not working in the sheriff department, then it can't possibly work in the community. And one of the things I want to say is that it's one thing to be accredited, but accreditation doesn't watch you 24-7. Accreditation doesn't respond to a calls for service. It's people in uniform. It's administrators that administer this public safety service. So accreditation doesn't give you a buy card. You have to be held accountable. You have to hold yourself accountable. Seconds. And that requires integrity. You have the integrity to run an agency the way it's supposed to be run from the inside out, then not only are we going to have better marks from people inside the agency, they'll be proud, high morale, but we will also have a greater receptiveness from this widely diverse community where we don't have that right now. We need unity in the community. And I'm the sheriff that's gonna bring unity to the community. Simmons, you have a rebuttal? Yeah, I would just say that uh, what I've experienced is that we have a lot of uni unity. We have a number of opportunities. We are engaged like we've never been engaged before. I have been to more neighborhood watches. I've discussed it with people, uh, crime with people that live in the neighborhood and they come up to me and they say, thank you so much for engaging in this dialogue. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so, so much for what you've done at Pensacola NAS. Thank you so much for what you have done at the Grocery Advantage. Your guys are professionally doing a great job. And that is engagement. That is what we do. <laughs> that is what we do if we want to be a part of our community. And that's what we're going to continue to do. It's not just getting information from someone based on a, a, a script that you're reading from. What it is, is living this life and it's being a part seconds. of this life. Yeah. And it's continuing to do what we've been doing. is over. Oh yeah, you gotta, yeah, you gotta stop. You just, we just let you finish your thought so you can't go into a whole nother. Then okay. we have um, one more from, from Chief Alexander and then yeah. we're going to go on to audience questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, first of all, you know, you, you gotta, protect the rights of all citizens. And when a deputy does something or an officer does something that they shouldn't, you should be willing to correct that. My opponent had the opportunity to do that. And that would have changed the outlook of law enforcement on a young African-American male. And he would not do it. He refused to do it after he was literally begged to do it because it would have been in the name of good law enforcement that he gave that young man that closure, but the young man hadn't done anything wrong. I want to let the public know we need to have leadership that's going to do it right and that's going to hold himself accountable. And that's how you improve diversity in the entire community, because people are going to know you're accountable and you are going to respect everybody. Thank you. All right. So 
Mary Louise, we wanted to check in to see if you had received any questions from the audience. Yes, I have. Uh, I right. got a couple from Facebook. I'll leave my camera off to see if we can, if that helps on the bandwidth situation. Here's, okay. the, here's the first question, and I, I guess this goes to Chief Simmons, right? Is it his turn or? I think so. Yes. Okay. Okay, Chief Simmons, how much does each candidate value hiring officers that actually live in the communities they serve in? Uh, I think that that's a, a, a very high priority for me. I made a comment a couple months ago. Um, you know, the question was, who do, who do we really want to recruit? Well, I want to re recruit local. I want someone that lives here, someone that was raised here, someone that has a family here, someone that, that has a vested interest in Escambia County that, that, uh, that we can use as a sheriff's office, but also the community can use as a mentor, as a leader, as someone they can go to and build that rapport with them. So I think if the question is, uh, how much uh, we put into it, we put a tremendous amount into it. 30 seconds. Now, that's not to say that we don't try to recruit um, uh, veterans, because we, again, we have a, a number of, of terrific military bases here, and we have the opportunity to, to recruit from them as well. But I think that if you concentrate on, on those that make us, and those that are going to stay here, those that are going to retire here and have grandkids here, I think it makes us a, a much better community. It makes us a much better law enforcement agency. Okay, thank you. Chief Alexander, same question. How much do you value hiring officers that actually live in the community they serve in? Uh, I value it very much. And matter of fact, I value it to the point where I've been tracking officers uh, that are working in other areas, other jurisdictions now that once came here first when they got out of the military because they wanted to be a part of public safety in their own neighborhood and they were turned down by the sheriff's department. And uh, I think that was a very disservice uh, to their service to this country, to protecting this country. Uh, I believe that we need to give more attention to the hiring practices and uh, at the sheriff's department. 30 the, seconds. The, the track record is that we turn down more talent that could come back here and serve us and they go to other communities. And this one young man is now in supervision in another jurisdiction that's much larger than ours. And we turned him away. This kind of stuff's got to stop. We got to stop serving words, but we got to do it with action. Action speaks louder than words. A rebuttal, Chief Simmons? Yeah, thank you. Uh, there's been a number of times today when my opponent has come up with some outrageous uh, plan or outrageous comment, and, and I have no idea what he's talking about. If he has a concern, again, about a complaint, he's never made a complaint about that. And now he talks about, we've turned someone down. I can assure you, if the sheriff's office or the police department, when I was the police chief, turned someone down, there's a reason for it. And, and, and a lot, on one hand, you say, well, we need to get the best and the brightest that we have. And that's what we try to do. So I can tell you that if we turn someone down, there's a reason for it. And to come up with these, these anecdotal- 30 seconds, Scott. That, 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 hey, this is going on. Uh, who is it? Let's hear the name. OK. Are, are we good? Okay, next question from the audience. This is the next to the last one. How will you prevent law enforcement from turning off body cameras? What will be the ramifications for turning off the cameras? And I guess this goes to you first, Chief Alexander. How will you prevent law enforcement from turning off body cameras? And what will be the ramifications for turning off the cameras? Well, when you, when you inappropriately turn off the cameras, uh, that takes you, first of all, you want to find out why. Uh, because sometimes it could be the, the officer or the deputy's thought process and what they saw. So you want to make sure this is an obvious blatant disregard for the policies and procedures for utilizing the camera. But when we find out that they've done something wrong that violates policy, we will hold them accountable for it. But the policies for body cameras are very clear and very specific and it gives you the guidelines 30 seconds. Determination. So, uh, but that requires supervisory monitoring as well. And that's part of the component for implement, implementing a body camera program. Thank you. Chief Simmons, same question. How will you prevent law enforcement from turning off body cameras? And what will be the ramifications for turning them off? Yeah, I think the ramifications are clear. 
Uh, first of all, you have to have the body cameras on. There's a policy that says in these cases and, and, and these uh, types of calls, you will have the body camera on. There are some specific uh, uh, opportunities where an, a law enforcement officer can turn off the body camera. If you're in a restroom or if you're in a bathroom or if you're in a location where the security of that location can be compromised, you can turn those body cameras off, but you have to document that in the report. The ramifications are you are violating a policy. 30 seconds. And and it depends on your history on, on what the actual ramifications are. You may not be terminated right away, but if you have a history of this sort of thing, you certainly can be terminated. When we, when we institute a policy, certainly like a body camera policy, we're serious about it. And that's why we have a, a detailed accredited policy that would govern that. Okay, thank you. And gentlemen, this is the last question from the audience. And they're referring back to the question that talked about the ads with, uh, with repelling and dune buggies, et cetera. How often does SWAT get called out and how often do police officers get to ride on a four wheeler? When was the last time that there was training that included the use of a rope? So I guess that's over to you first, Chief Simmons. How often does SWAT get called out and how often do police officers actually get to ride on a four wheeler when was the last time that there was training that included the use of a rope? Okay. Well, um, I will tell you that the training with regards to repelling happens, uh, happens all the time. Training, we had SWAT training today. They utilized the repelling uh, with use of a rope. I know because I was on the SWAT team, I used ropes like that. We, we did those, those types of repels. If the question is how often is SWAT, um, a SWAT utilized. They're utilized probably a couple times a week. They're used to serve high high risk search warrants. They're used to serve uh, high risk arrest warrants, and they're obviously used whenever we have a SWAT call out. They were utilized on the um, you know the gentleman, the gentleman that came out with a with a sniper rifle and shot a couple rounds at our deputies. We called our SWAT operators out there. Thirty seconds. They were used at NAS. We called our SWAT operators out there. Um, and, and fortunately for us, there were SWAT operators that were actually there and that the initial um, uh, response to NAS and took out the, the terrorist, the terrorist I might add, that died with several hundred rounds on him. Um, heaven knows how many lives we saved from that. So to say that these types of things aren't used and, and the, the, the deputies that work at the beach utilize those four wheelers all the time. Every day they utilize those four wheelers and we train with those four wheelers because uh, that's what's important. Time is up. Thank you. Okay, Chief Alexander, over to you. How often does SWAT get called out and how often do police officers actually get on a four-wheeler? When was the last time that there was training that included the use of a rope? Well, honestly, those, the SWAT call-outs and the training with the rope is exclusively for SWAT members. Uh, your your, your, your day-to-day -day deputy is not gonna get uh, training with the propelling of a rope, uh, and neither is the everyday deputy going to ride on a four-wheeler. Only those that are assigned to the beach are, are going to have that privilege of riding every day. So to use that as a realistic approach for recruitment is a very bad strategy. It's pretty much hyping them up to think that every day is a SWAT call out, and my opponent know good and well that's not true. Every day SWAT is not called out. 30 seconds. They specially paid for that. But the thing about it is when you make recruitment a realistic picture of your everyday work as a police, it's going to show you helping people as well as responding to calls, complaints for services, and arresting people as well. It's all a part of a day's work. Uh, I can assure you that when we repel from a swap from a, a tower or into a window, I can assure you that when we use our four-wheeler uh, to save someone from drowning, I can assure you that when we call the SWAT team, all they're doing is helping people. They're helping people from bona fide bad guys. That's why we have SWAT. That's why it's on the video. If, if you want us to do a video of people writing reports in their car, we, we could have done that. We chose to use what, what we feel like is the most exciting and the most realistic parts of law enforcement. Okay. And, and we have one last question for, that's just come in from the audience. Um, how will, and, and Chief Alexander, you go first on this one. How will, or I'm sorry, it should be Chief Simmons. Oh gosh, I'm completely confused. Okay, all right, 
I think it's Chief Simmons. Um, how how will each candidate attack drug trafficking as it pertains to the higher level traffickers and not just the man on the street? Again, that's that's my wheelhouse. I spent well over a dozen years working in narcotics, whether it's undercover capacity or yeah. on uh, violent drug trafficking task forces. We work with DEA, DEA exclusively. So how will we combat that? We will use these federal partners. We will use our state partners. We will make sure that the people that are bringing this, these drugs into our community are held accountable. We will seize their drugs, we will seize their weapons, and we'll make sure that they go to either state prison or federal prison, depends on, on, on how much we can get on them. I think, that, I, I think that is important. And now there are lower level individuals that we, that we do arrest, but when I was in narcotics and our plan for the future is to make sure that these people that come in and affect so many lives in a negative way, to make sure that these are the targets that, that we have. And these are the partnerships with our federal authorities that, that we want to make sure. I was talking to DEA just yesterday, and we're just so excited about the future and how much we can do together. Uh, again, the sky is the limit. Thank you. Chief Alexander, let me repeat the, the question for you. And I'm sorry, I apologize if I got the order mixed up. Um, how will you... Uh, attack drug trafficking as it pertains to the higher level traffickers and not just the man on the street? Well, definitely you're gonna to have to get out and use uh, intelligence generated evidence to help you work at multi-level and multi-jurisdictions. Uh, the drug trafficking in our, in our county is not just exclusive in our county, it's connected to a pipeline that goes uh, from South Florida all the way out to the West Coast. So it takes multi-level partnership, but it also takes a realistic outlook on what uh, effect is drugs having on your community and how can you work with the resources there to make sure that you're doing your due diligence here. My opponent has spent most of his career running street level drug dealers. And, and, and when he talk about working with DEA, that's great when they include uh, us in, but you need to be uh, focused on that on the front end and, and make sure that, 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 that you're not using these little, uh, these little nickel dime arrests to just, you know, boast yourself as a drug man. This problem in Scammon County is more than just drugs. So you got to be a progressive minded leader to know that. But if you're traditional minded, then you're going to keep doing what you've always done. It's time for a change in Scammon County. Okay. All right. Rebuttal, Chief Simmons. Yeah, if, if, if the thought here is the, the attempt to demean the work that we did in narcotics, um, I would remind you that um, because of the work that we did, and it's not street level stuff, I received not one, not two, not three, but four City of Pensacola Merit Awards, all for heavy drug investigations and arrests. Not one, not two, not three, not four, but five certificates of meritorious service, again, for, for combating the drugs that were plaguing our area back in the late 80s in the early 90s. Uh, my, sure, surely my, my opponent uh, remembers that, even though he was out, not out in the street at that time, he surely remembers that. Okay, thank you. And Haley, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. All right, so that concludes our question portion. Um, and so we're just gonna uh, wrap up with our closing statements. Um, so we're gonna start with Chief Simmons um, to go first for your two minute closing. Thank you very much. And I, I really appreciate you, you having me on here. I appreciate those who called in or wrote in some questions. Uh, very good dialogue, and I really appreciate it. I can tell you that safety in Escambia County is the important thing. It is the number one priority. And Escambia County deserves a sheriff that has the experience. It doesn't have one year of experience as police chief, like my opponent, but over five years of experience. It doesn't have one year as assistant police chief, as my opponent does, but six years of, of, of experience. My opponent has zero experience at Board of County Commissioners working over public safety. He has zero experience in corrections. He has zero experience at the Escambia County Sheriff's Office as the Chief Deputy. I am, again, I am the, one of the most decorated officers in, law, in uh, Pensacola Police Department history. I have a master's degree in public administration. I've done this job. I've proven to be able to do this job. And the number one priority is keeping the drugs off of our streets and keeping the violent drug dealers off of our streets. I have that experience. So if qualifications matter, if safety matters, then the choice is crystal clear. You have no choice but to vote Chip Simmons, Sheriff of Escambia County. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you. 
All right, Chief Alexander, your two minute closing statement. Okay, well, uh, again, thank you for allowing me to be on this uh, forum with you and also thank the audience for their participation as well. Um, you know, uh, talking about experience, uh, you know, my opponent talks about the experience. He sat in these positions, but he lacked the experience of actually getting out and working with people and working with agencies. I was in the position, I was in a position under him. We got that stuff done, not with his help, but because we were trained and developed to rise to the occasion of leadership and get it done. And that's why I'm running today because we don't need to go through that again. We need leadership that has experience. We need leadership that has integrity. We need people that are forward thinking because Pensacola is growing and is more diverse. It needs to be all inclusive. We want you to be a part of your own public safety, but it takes an agency that's gonna reach out and connect with you and work with you to make your neighborhood safe. Make your children experience growing up in Scammy County very promising and giving them a promising future. That takes partnership, not partisanship. I'm bringing unity to Escambia County. I will be the sheriff that will respect you and protect you, all citizens. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. All right, Mary Louisa, do you have any more housekeeping items before we uh, close no. out for tonight? No, I just wanted to remind everyone in the audience that if they need information on candidates or voter registration, to look at the site called 411.org. It's a site sponsored by the league that has all kinds of great information about the upcoming election on all the various offices. And to just thank the candidates for your time and effort. We're so glad you could join us tonight. You guys did a great job. Thank you to our moderators. Thank you to our audience. And again, thank you, Vivian Faircloth, our director. If it's all right with everybody, I'll go ahead and end the Zoom session. That will turn off Facebook and also uh, let the recording of the forum begin to process. Okay, everyone? Thank, thank you. you. Thank you again and good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.